All right, so um, if you've been with us on Wednesday nights, we've been looking at uh, the book of Nehemiah. We've been in a, in a study in the book of Nehemiah, and so the um, book of Nehemiah is all about building the wall. And Nehemiah uh, was one of the exiles in Persia. He gets word from, uh, from news from back home that Jerusalem is in, in ruins. The wall is torn down. The gates are burned. And he's just broken over this. And so as he prays and he fasts over this, God calls him to go back to uh, to Jerusalem and lead a restoration project uh, to rebuild the wall. Nothing, you know, he, he's not going to be the king, he's not going to be priest, he's, he is not going to build the temple, nothing so glorious and glamorous as that. He's going to be in charge of heading up, building a wall. And he's not going to do it by himself. He's going to um, enlist the help of everybody. And it's going to take everybody to build the wall. And so it it becomes a great lesson um, in leadership, but it, it also becomes a great lesson in unity and working together. And so we're going to take a look at that tonight. And so uh, tonight um, is all about um, is all about um, building the wall. Is all about the different families that build the wall. Um, you know, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of go uh, piece by piece and and section by section through this, um, we're listening to, Lisa and I are listening to a, I won't call the guy's name even though he's dead now, but anyway, uh, he, he's going through the Bible, you know, um, you probably know who I'm talking about if I say through the Bible, that pretty much gives it away, but anyway, um, I'm amazed, he's like the whole word to the whole world, and then he'll get to passages like this and he'll go, now to me this is just as dry as dirt, so I'm just going to skip over this. Well, I don't think it's, to me, it's not dry as dirt, and God put it in here for a reason, so we're going to look at it, and we're going to see what we, can, what we can gather from that. I gave you a little supplemental handout. Uh, one side of it actually pertains to last week's study, and if I would have found it last week, I would have given it to you last week, but I, but I didn't find it until this week, uh, and it kind of outlines his little night inspection of the walls of Jerusalem that we talked about last week. So you might find that helpful there. But especially what you're going to find helpful tonight is on the opposite side of that. Uh, it goes section by section, family by family. Uh, the, each, each section, uh, where it was and who built it. And we're just, what I want you to do is keep this out, keep it handy. And as we read through this, you can literally just follow this around and you can just see where every family was, uh, every group was, and where they built. Uh, and so it starts when the sh at the Sheep Gate. Uh, so if you look over, uh, if the, the temple uh, is right here and then here's, here's the Sheep Gate. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be temple faces east, so I'm thinking this is going to be, I don't have it, um, I want to say this is going to be like south, I think, but I don't, don't quote me, huh, that part is pointing north, so he's, we're going to be working our way um, south, uh, at west and, and south around in, a, in this counterclockwise direction. So anyway, start at the sheep gate and you follow your way around. All right, so let's take a look. Let's dig in. Uh, I'm in chapter 3, verse 1. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. So you can look at the sheep gate and you can see um, Eliashib and the priest right, right there, that little black section. And you see how it how it will go uh, from there. Um, they consecrated it, hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Uh, next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built. You can see that's the little blue section there. 
as we work our way around. Um, and next to them, Zachor, the son of Emery, built. Also the sons of Hassaniah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its bars with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz, made repairs. Next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel, made repairs. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Benaiah, uh, Benai, Benai, I don't know how to say that, Benai, made repairs. Next to them, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. Moreover, Jehoiada, the son of Paseah, and Meshulam, the son of Besodei, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Melatiah, the Gibeonite, Jadon, the Maranathite, the men of Gibeon and Mizpah repaired the residence of the governor of the region beyond the river. Next to him, Uziel, the son of Harhaiah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs. They fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. And next to them, Rephaiah, the son of Hur, leader of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Harumoth, made repairs in front of his house. Next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashbaniah, made repairs. Malchijah, the son of Haram, and Hashab, the son of Pehath, Pehath Moab, made, I'm sorry, I'm doing the best I can with it, repaired another section as well as the tower of the ovens. And next to him was Shalom, the son of Halohesh, leader of half the district of Jerusalem. He and his daughters made repairs. All right, so that takes us all the way to the valley gate. So you see it takes this whole little section here those 12 verses covered everything from here, the sheep gate, all around this turn, all the way up to this blue section here uh, by the valley gate. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this so that it doesn't, it's not just a long list of names when you, so you go around away going, that was dry as dirt. I don't know why I read that. So, so let's talk about it a little bit. All right, so... It, the description of the builders begins with the high priest. Uh, why would this be significant? He's the leader. He's the spiritual leader. Do what? What she's going to say? Yeah. So, so the high priest and and uh, and his fellow priests they're going to start the work. Um, they're going to be setting the example. Uh, they're not exempting themselves from the work. Uh, it's awfully hard to lead from behind. Uh, you lead by example, and so they're out setting the example. So that's significant. Uh, this was going to be a project that involved everybody from the high priest uh, to the, the lowest um, man on the totem pole. It, it then goes on to say that they built the sheep gate they consecrated it and hung its doors. Now, why is it significant or what does it indicate to say that they consecrated the sheep gate? If you consecrate something, what, what does that do what? Purified it. If something is consecrated, what's another? We have an even more churchy word that we use sanctified, dedicated. You're missing the most churchy word of all. Set apart. And what, so you're, 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 hitting, you're defining the word, everything. If something is set apart, holy is the word I'm looking for. Holy is the word I'm looking for. I started to sing, sanctified, sanctified, sanctified. But I didn't know if you'd get it from that either. So anyway. Um. So, no, okay. So, 
they saw this undertaking as a, as a holy endeavor. That is to say, they saw it as God's work. This is, wasn't just another menial project. It wasn't just busy work. It was the Lord's work. And anything you're doing for the Lord is not busy work. It's, it's sacred work. And so that's how they saw it. What did they do to consecrate? So, to, probably all of that. I mean, they, they, they prayed over it, I'm sure. Um, I mean, typically when they would consecrate something, it involved anointing it with oil. We're not specifically told that that's how they did this, but I mean, I think it's reasonable to think that perhaps they did. So, so then we move on to, um, and I'm I'm kind of I'm not going to hit every one of these groups. I'm just gonna just gonna hit uh, a few of them. Um, I want to look at the Tekoites uh, in verse five. What what do we learn about the the nobles of the Tekoites here? <laughs> we learned they're kind of lazy. They thought they were apparently uh, too good uh, to, to do that or, or it was beneath them or whatever. Um, maybe they thought, well, everybody else is doing that. They don't need me to do that. Um, so, so who all did that affect? Let's think about that a minute. Well, it, it affected the whole group for one thing because A, it affected the morale but it also meant that there were fewer people working, so everybody had to do more work. And specifically, the other Tekoites, we'll see as we move through this, they, they not only repair this section, but they also repair another section. So the Tekoites actually end up repairing two sections, where everybody else seemingly just repairs one. So it kind of begs the question, if the nobles would have pitched in and did their part, would the, the other guys only have had to do their one? But by them not doing their part, others had to do double. Now, surely we all can see the application in that. We all have a job to do in the Lord's work. Uh, and it's all important. It's all significant. It's all holy work because it's the Lord's work. Uh, but when for whatever reason we, we don't do it, uh, then everybody suffers, uh, and it means either it either means one of two things: either either the job doesn't get done at all, or it means somebody's going to have to do their job and your job too. So um, it's it's important, you know. And Paul ha talks a lot about this in the New Testament about we being the body of Christ, and we're all members in the body of Christ, and we all have a job to do. Um, you know, if my if my right leg isn't working, my left leg has to hop twice as hard to get me where I'm going kind of deal. Uh, everybody has to pull their weight. But, and this is maybe the most important thing, who's the other group that was affected by this? Who else lost out on this? Well, the guy, yeah, I mean, the guy next to him, sure. I mean, it, it was morale... Uh, damaging for those working around them and seeing them. What about the nobles? I mean, we talked about how lazy they are. Does anybody feel sorry for them? I kind of do. Because here's the thing. They had an opportunity to be a part of what God was doing. And for whatever reason, they squandered that. And now it's gone forever. Yeah, I mean, they... They squandered that opportunity, but now here we are 2,500 years later, we're reading the story, and what do we remember? Do we remember how great and glorious the nobles of the Tekoites were? No, what do we talk about? They're just lazy. You have an opportunity in this, you know, we're here, you know, in this, in this brief time called life, God is going to put opportunities in front of you. You either take them or you, or you lose them forever. And I don't want people 100 years from now going, those people at Memorial Heights, man, they were just lazy. They never did anything. Uh, I, want them, I want them to say, hey, 
you know, they rolled up their slaves and, and, and they built the horse gate and they built the dung gate and they, you know, no job was too big and no job was too small. They pulled together and they got it done. That's how I want them to remember us uh, when, we're, when we're in heaven uh, away from the refuse gate. Yes, sir. Yes, that is the Tekoa. Yes, so that's what I was saying. They, they build two, two different sections. So, um, huh? That part will come later, that's right. So, we're Valley Gate. Where am I? Where's the. I skipped some, and that's why I'm throwing myself off. Um, so, Mr. Zadok. The old city gate. Right, they're, they're here, and then, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we hadn't, they're working their way around. Yeah. yeah, so the yellow is where we are, where they were, and then they're working their way. Oh, they're right here. No, they're here. To Coites, yeah, they're in the black, and that's where... Sheep gate. <laughs> now, you got me looking at this picture now, and I can't figure out where I am. Okay, so we started here, and we're working our way around. I thought we worked all the way to the valley gate. Oh, and now we're talking about it. That's what we're doing. I had worked my way to the valley gate, and I'm moving on, but, yeah, we're backing up to talk about it. Right, so, I don't know. I've lost my mind. I don't know. I went to the dentist, and I think he gave me some bad drugs today or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, the uh, so yes, so the so the Tekoites first are described here, the little black section by the old city gate. The nobles wouldn't help them. So then you get over on the other side of the water gate, which we'll look at in just a little bit. Uh, and there's a whole other section they build. So they actually build two two sections. That is a large section, you know. And maybe they said, you know, we're not going to let people judge us by our leaders. We're going we're gonna to roll up our sleeves and we're going to do twice as much that way. Um, so what would, what, would, uh, what would be some of the more desirable jobs uh, in this wall construction that you see just in these verses we read here? What, what would be a section you might like to work on? The doors might not be too bad. Yeah, that wouldn't be bad. Um, verse 7 uh, uh, the uh, um, Mel 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 Melatiah, uh, the Gibeon, uh, and Jaden, uh, and the men of Gibeon repaired the residence of the governor. Hey, that wouldn't be bad. I'd be working on the governor's house. I could do that. I wouldn't mind that. Um, you know, I think, you know, it would be kind of uh, uh, cool to brag and say, I helped build the wall by the Tower of the Hundred. And that's, that sounds like a movie title, the Wall of the Tower of the Hundred, or the Tower of Hananel. You know, uh, so those would be some pretty cool jobs to do. What would be some not so desirable jobs to do? The fish gate. Yeah, how many of you ever been fishing? What happens if you leave your fish laying out uh, in the Jerusalem sun for about three days? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, these guys were dedicated, you know. That's been, what about another one? The obvious one is what? The dung gate, the refuse gate, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but as I read it, they all kind of done, they, they did a complete section. From foundation through, so, which means you've got to spend even longer. If all I've got to do is come to the the dung gate and just put the trim on, that's not so bad. But if I've got to go from the ground up, you know that that's going to be a, not a pleasant job. But they all did it. You know what does that tell us? That no job is any more important uh, than another, and no worker is any less important 
any other. Um, so let me ask you this. What's the most important section of the wall? Trick question now, so careful how you answer. The most important section of the wall is the, is the section that doesn't get built. Because the section that doesn't get built makes, makes the city vulnerable. It is the, the weakest link in the chain, so to speak. So if somebody drags up and doesn't do their job, um, what if, what if the, the guy that's doing the refuse gate says, uh, you know, I'm not going to do my, my part of the wall, or I'm, all, I'm, I'm not going to do it right. I'm just going to go in and do the, the, the quickest, simplest job I can. They won't know the difference. I'll plaster some, some mud up there and paint it, and it'll be fine, and we'll go. Then what? then the whole city becomes vulnerable in that one spot. Everybody has to do their job because every job is important. Um, same in a church. Uh, I don't care what your job in the church is, it's important. Um, if you teach Sunday school, if you keep nursery, if you sweep the floor, if you run the sound, if you sing in the choir, it's all important. And if, if, if any of us aren't doing our job, then church is weak in that area um, so I mean you know that that's the obvious I'm not telling you anything that you don't know and can't see I mean that's the obvious the obvious application there but I do think it's it's awful easy sometimes in the Lord's work uh, to go nobody knows nobody nobody sees no you know nobody cares and I, I mean I've been there I mean I've in in our you know, early on in the ministry, we've been in some. We were in a little church, pastor, a little church that all he wanted to do was fight all the time. And you know, and I, I mean, I would just come home in the in the evening, and I'd, I'd be like, you know, God, what are we doing here? I mean, what you know, why? And and Lisa, you know, Lisa's ever the cheerleader, you know, and she's like, you know, God knows you're, you know, God's gonna knows you're here, and he's he's got, you know. We're going to be here till he's finished with us here, and then he's got somewhere else. And I said, who's going to even find us here? I mean, we're in the, I mean nobody even knows we're here. And uh, the, uh, God did. And that, that's right. And, uh, but the boys were just little bitty. They were like, like, like two and three or two and four at the time. And uh, they were watching this, and my boys would die if they knew I ever told you that they watched Miss Patty Cake. But uh, they, it's little bitty guys. They watched uh, Miss Patty Cake. Was that her name? And uh, so she was. She and she always had the little sing along songs with it. And and she was doing a little song um, about Moses and uh, being in the little basket. And she said, and the song went, "God knows Moses is a floating, is a floating, floating, floating. Uh, God knows Moses is a floating, and he's in a little basket, safe and sound." So. One day when I was having my pity party, <laughs> and, I, and I, was, I was like, I don't know what God is doing. I don't know why he's leaving us here. And, you know, how are we ever going to go somewhere else? Nobody even knows we're here. I mean, we're just here flying under the radar. And Lisa just started singing that song. But she didn't say Moses. She said Marky. God knows Marky is a floating in a little basket, safe and sound. And, you know, I mean, sometimes you get to, work on the governor's residence and sometimes you get to work on the dung gate. But it's all important and God knows that you're there and he knows what you're doing and uh, in the end it's all good. And then you get to go to Claremore, Oklahoma and, and, and work on the, on the good stuff there. Um, what's the, do what? <laughs> Ah, y'all are easy. I'm just excited to have people come that come to church on Wednesday night and actually want to learn the Bible. I mean, I've been in churches where they just want to come and tell you every step of the way why you're wrong. You know, I mean, they they they, they didn't come to learn anything. They just come to argue with you. And I and I'm like, why? why? I, I didn't say anything. I just worked on my dung gate and kept on rolling. But I'm like, why are you here? But anyway, um, moving on. Enough Mark's pity party. Well, moving on. What is the significant What's significant about Shalom's repair in verse 12? Yeah, his daughters are helping him. 
Um, so there was a job for everybody on this wall, regardless of age, strength, gender, or position. And back then they just had two genders, by the way. But they, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Depends on who you talk to, I guess. So anyway, um, yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and even the old city that what they were doing was was huge. Right, because Bethlehem is part of the the uh, uh, the Palestinian controlled West Bank. So yeah, <laughs> you have to go through Checkpoint Charlie and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So all right. Um, okay, so let's move on. I, I want us to have plenty of time. So let's move on to verse 13 as we continue to make our way around. So we're now at the valley gate and we are working our way uh, around the, the corner to the water gate here. Uh, verse 13. Hanan and the inhabitants of the Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They built it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the refuse gate. Malchijah, the son of Rechab, leader of the district of Beth Hakarim, I don't know uh, these words, repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Shalon, the son of Kolhosa, leader of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, repaired the wall of the pool of Shelah by the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, this is a different Nehemiah by the way, the son of Azbuk, leader of the half the district of Bethsur, made repairs as far as the place in front of the tombs of David to the man-made pool and as far as the house of the mighty. After him, the Levites under Rehum, the son of Bani, uh, made repairs next to him Hashabiah, the leader of half the district of Keeliah, made repairs for his district. After him, their brethren under Baviah, the son of Hinadad, leader of the other half of the district uh, of Keeliah, made repairs. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the leader of Mizpah, repaired another section in front of the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zebai carefully repaired the other section from the buttress to the door of the house of Elishab the high priest. After him, Miramoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Elishab to the end of the house of Elishab. After him, uh, the priest, the men of the plain, made repairs. After him, Benjamin and Hashab made repairs opposite their, their house. house. After them, Azariah, the son of Maasiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs by his house. After him, Benuiah, the son of Hinnadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah the but to the buttress even as far as the corner. Palal, the son of Uzziah, made repairs opposite the buttress on the tower which projects from the king's upper house that was by the court of the prison. And after him, Padiah, the son of Parash, made repairs. All right, let's stop there for just a minute. Um, so, Malchijah, uh, he, what is he uh, repairing? The refuse gate, the dung gate. Uh, so, you know, we've kind of already said a little bit about that. Sometimes the Lord calls us to a work uh, that's not pleasant or comfortable, but it's no less significant. So that's, you know, that's Melchizedek. Now, to make it even more interesting, um, Shalom is the guy that's working right beside Melchizedek. Now, where, what, does, what section of the gate does Melchizedek, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Shalom, yeah, what, what, section does Shalom get to repair? 
Well, did I misread that? So 13. I mean, I mean, okay. Um, Thirteen. Malchijah built the. Yeah, fifteen. No, 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 no. Look at fifteen. Look at fifteen. Shalon, the son of Col Jose, leader of the district of Mizpah repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, repaired the wall of the pool of Sheila by the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. So he's repairing by the king's garden. Okay, now, if I'm Melchijah and I'm repairing the dung gate, and right beside me, I can look over, and here's another guy, and he gets to repair the wall by the king's garden. How's that going to make you feel? <laughs> might, might he have gone, okay, I don't understand who laid these projects out. God, I don't understand what you're doing, but he gets to smell roses all day, and I smell not roses all day. Uh, but... Um, I think it's a great lesson in you do what the Lord's called you to do and you don't look around at what other people are doing. Yes, sir. You know, that I, we're not really told uh, and a lot of these people just repaired it in front of their house. and We'll kind of see that in the, in the next section. A lot of them just repaired right in front of their house. So I don't know if it was kind of a volunteer basis. I'll just take it and do it or if some of it was done by Lot. Um, you know, in, uh, in the end of John's gospel, uh, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to the disciples. And he appears to Peter. And he goes through the whole, Peter, do you love me? And da 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 da, -da three times. And then he says to Peter this, in verse 18 of uh, John chapter 21, most assuredly, Jesus speaking, I say to you, when you were younger, he's talking to Peter, you girded yourself, walked where you wished, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, sig signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, that would be John, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And Peter, uh, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? In other words, you just said, I'm going to die. What about John? And Jesus said to him, If I will, or if I want it to be this way, that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Um, man, such a, such a lesson we see, not only in the words of Jesus, but in in Melchijah's job of repairing the dung gate. Don't look at the guy repairing uh, the wall by the king's garden. Look at, focus on what you're doing. As soon as you start looking around at other people and saying they got it better than me or easier than me or woe is me, Satan's got you right where he wants you. Then you're spiraling down this pity party thing um, and then crop up things like envy and jealous, jealousy and covetousness uh, and resentment and all of these ugly things. Uh, so focus on what you're doing. God called you to build the dung gate, build the dung gate. And God who sees in secret will reward you openly. Um, secretly, I'd still rather done the rose garden myself. But anyway, yes. The, the guy that did the, yeah, the guy that did the, the dung gate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like no one in the project, with the exception of the nobles that we referenced earlier, was looking for the easy way out. They're like, what do you need doing? We're, we're going to get it done. Uh, look at verse 20. Um, 
and uh, Baruch, how did he approach his work? Yeah, so carefully is one translation of that. Other translations say something like zealously, uh, you know, in other words, passionately. In other words, uh, he, he did it with his whole heart. Uh, hey, you know, people can tell if your heart's not in it. And God for sure can tell if your heart's not in it. So if you're doing something for the Lord, do it with your whole heart. Be glad. Hey, I've got, a, I've got something to do for the Lord. Uh, and be glad of that. All right. Let's, uh, let's get this last little section in here. Verse 26. Moreover, the Nethanim who dwelt in Ophel made repairs as far as the place in front of the water gate toward the east and on the projecting tower. After them, the Tekoites. There we see them again. They, they, they're, they didn't stop with one section. They're doing two. Uh, repaired another section next to the great projecting tower and as far as the wall of Ophel. Beyond the horse gate, the priest made repairs, each in front of his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Emmer, made repairs in front of the uh, in front of his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, the and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaph repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, made repairs in front of his dwelling. After him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the Nethanim and of the merchants in front of the Mifkad gate and as far as the upper room at the corner. And between the upper room and at the corner, as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmiths, and the merchants made repairs. Okay, um, so the Tekoites, as we said, made an, another section, repaired another section of the wall. Um, a, a couple of things we can say about this. Number one, they didn't let their nobles' lack of participation hinder them. In other words, even if the guy that's supposed to be setting the example is setting a poor example, don't let that stop you um, from doing what God's called you to do. And also, as we said before, maybe if the nobles had done their job, the other guys wouldn't have had to do twice their work. So just something to remember uh, as we do our task um, to our, the best of our abilities. There's many that are said uh, to uh, uh, make repairs in front of their own houses. Um, you see that in verse 23 and verse 28 and verse 29 and verse 30. Um, what can we say from this? They, they repaired right in front of their own house. They want to protect their home. And, right? And maybe they did what they could. You know, maybe they said, you know, I can't go and build a whole wall or a whole section of a wall, but I can do this one little part right in front of my own house. And that's, they did what they, uh, what they could do. Um, you know, God isn't calling you to build the wall all by yourself. Uh, just start in front of your own house. You know, you're not going to reach the world for Jesus. I, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but you're not going to win the world for Jesus. But can you, can you just make a start in front of your own house? Um, you know, you, you may not be called to be a missionary to a village in Africa, but you can tell your neighbors about Jesus. Um, let me tell you a little story. And I cleared this with the person before, before I did. Um, so I've got a 93-year-old church member. And she joined our church, I don't know, a year or so ago, I guess. And not long ago, she invited her neighbor to come to church. Just, just invited her neighbor to come to church. And her neighbor came, and her neighbor joined our church a couple of Sundays ago. She didn't stop there. She said, I got another neighbor. <laughs> and she invited her. And she was at Sam's and Sal's yesterday. 93 years old. She's not, she's not going to win the world of Jesus at 93. But you know, she's doing what she can. She's starting in front of her own house. Building the wall, building the kingdom, brick by brick in front of her own house. 
you know, we all can do something. Uh, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And that's kind of the lesson in all of this, I, I see. Priests and perfumers and merchants and goldsmiths, they're all mentioned as participating in the project. What does this tell us? Right, I mean, uh, none of these were construction trades. Now, now, listen to this list again that I just read. Priests, perfumers, merchants, goldsmiths. No brick masons, uh, no carpenters, uh, no, you know, no, no construction trade people, you know, uh, no, uh, you know, steel um, workers, no welders, you know, not that they did that then, but, you know, you understand what I'm saying. These weren't construction people. Um, they weren't skilled builders, but they did what they could. And archaeologists now that are recovering parts of the wall that Nehemiah built uh, say, you know, we're pretty sure it must have been the wall from Nehemiah's time because you can tell it wasn't of a, a, a professional quality. In other words, the people that built this, they didn't know anything about building a wall. They just knew what God was telling them to do, and they just got in there and did it. So, you know, we all have a job to do. I have mine and you have yours. Um, you know, I, I'm not the man you won't build in your house. If you if you want to do it, I'll just tell you straight up, if you if you want a if you want a an addition built onto your home, I'm not the man that you want you want to call to do that. But I'll tell you one thing, I'm not I'm not too good to sling a hammer or or, or you know, cut a two by four or, or something if I need to. Do <laughs> Dig a ditch, yeah, and I was stopping short of saying digging a ditch, but, you know, I don't know anything about building stuff, but I'm not too good to. And you, you may say, hey, I, you know, per the mark, there's no way I can do what, what you do. Well, maybe that's good, and that keeps me having a job. If everybody, if everybody could do what I do, then, you know, I, I wouldn't be drawing a paycheck for doing it, I guess. But you can do something. And what you do is just as important as what I do. And that's the lesson of this whole thing. Um, questions on that? Any, anything from chapter 3? Right. They didn't have guns in those days. But yeah, I get what you're saying, right. Yeah, so we're going to see that in, like in the next chapter when the adversaries come, you know, and they're literally like building with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. I mean, it's, it's, it was dangerous work as well. Do what? Ordinary people. That's right. That's right. Um, it's just some application questions there. Um, what does Nehemiah chapter 3 teach us about doing the Lord's work? No job, you know, we've, we've said this, no job too big, no job too small, no person too big, no person too small. Why is unity so important in, uh, in accomplishing the task uh, uh, of God? That I think I've got a typo in there, but accomplishing the task that God has called us to. Why is unity so important? Yeah, no gap, yeah. So the, the illustration that I thought of was like, a football team, a football play. So, you know, you watch the highlight reel and your beloved OU Sooners will use them because goodness knows my Cowboys can't catch a pass in the end zone. So, but your Oklahoma Sooners, you know, you see your, your who's your, who's your, I don't even, I don't follow OU football. Who's your, who's your standout wide receiver? Y'all don't follow it anyway, either. Who? For Arkansas? So anyway, your standout all-star wide receiver, you see the highlight reel, and he's caught a pass in the end zone for a touchdown, and that's all you see, and everybody jumps up and cheers, and, and he's, they carry him off on, on their shoulders because he's the hero of the game. He won the game for them. What you didn't see was all the things that went in to make that play happen. You didn't see the line that everybody blocked. If one of those linemen had a not made their block, then the defensive lineman would have come in, sacked the quarterback, and that play would not have happened. If the quarterback had not have made a precise pass, 
and had the time in the pocket to make the pass, that play would not have happened. Other, that wasn't the only wide receiver. There was probably three other wide receivers that were all running routes. They all had to run their route and run their route precisely to draw the defense away from the receiver that would catch the ball. And if they don't run their routes and run them correctly, that play doesn't happen. They don't get to catch the ball. They don't get their their picture on the evening news, they just run the routes, probably get punched in the, in the jaw off the line. They run their route and they get no glory for it. But if they don't do it, that play doesn't happen. And the halfback, whose job isn't even to block, his job is to run with the football. But guess what? It's a pass play and here comes some linebacker on a blitz and if he doesn't pick up that blitz, the quarterback goes down, that play doesn't happen. And so he does what's not his job, which technically is his job, and picks up the blitzing linebacker and blocks it to give the quarterback enough time and the line makes their blocks and the wide receivers run their route and the other wide receiver runs the route into the end zone, the quarterback makes the pass and all you see is people jumping up and down because the wide receiver caught the ball in the end zone. He's the star. Yeah, he's the star. But if everybody else hadn't done their job, the star would have looked pretty silly laying, you know, on his back because the ball never got there. So, you know, you have a job to do, and it's important. And you may never get your name in the, in the, the Baptist Standard or ba ba what is it in Oklahoma? Baptist Messenger. Uh, you may never get on the evening news. And in a Baptist church, if you can stay off the evening news, that's usually a good thing. That's what we're shooting for. But your job is important, and that's what I want you to know. Um, what evidence do we see that Nehemiah's leadership had good leadership skills? Good leaders get people involved. And he, he did a good job of getting everybody in involved. If I'm doing my job as a leader, it's not that I would go do everything while you sit and keep the pew warm. If I'm doing my job as a leader, I'm going to have you doing something. Um, and if you're not doing anything, if you come to me and say, Brother Mark, I'm not doing anything, I need something to do, and we'll put you to work. It, it may be building in front of the dung gate, can't promise that, but there'll be a job for you to do. Nehemiah did a good job of getting people involved here. Questions on that? The wall got built, and that's the bottom line. So, I have a brief video. It's only like about a minute long um, on, on this section of Nehemiah here. The entire plan now depends on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They must drop everything and apply themselves to the work. The first to volunteer are the high priest and his men. Then Eliashib the high priest arose with his brethren the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and put up its doors. And next to them the men of Jericho built. And next to them built Zakur the son of Imri. The sons of Hasna'ah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set up its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them Meremoth the son of Uriah, the son of Hakots, fortified. And next to them, Mishulam, the son of Berechia, the son of Mishaizad El, fortified. And next to him, Sadok, the son of Ba'ana, fortified. And they restored Jerusalem all the way to the broad wall. High on the hill, above the layer of the destruction of Jerusalem, the excavators uncovered a part of the wall and tower, apparently from the Persian period. The archaeologist Elat Mazar believes this is a segment of the wall built by Nehemiah, Poor construction, gaps between the stones, the builders were ordinary people like us, and the building materials that they gathered from the ruins were not of the best quality. Nevertheless, the wall they built survived the entire Second Temple period, more than 500 years. An abrupt stop, but that's where it stops for this week. I appreciate you being here tonight, and I, I hope that the Lord has blessed you. Phil, is, did you want to say something about the trip tomorrow?